Uh, right, we're going to do metaphysics and epistemology today. There's some good words to conjure with. Uh, metaphysics and epistemology. Uh, metaphysics is the study of reality. Uh, it deals with questions like, what is there? Or what exists? Um, if you, that's actually a branch of metaphysics called ontology. You've, I think you've probably heard me mention ontology before, no? Uh, ontology is your, your ontology is your list of what exists. So, who believes in ghosts? A couple of people. Okay, well, on your ontology, you have ghosts. Uh, if you believe in God, on your list of what exists, you have God. If you don't believe in God, on your list of what exists, God doesn't feature. And if you don't believe in ghosts, ghosts won't feature on your list of what exists. But chairs probably would, lecturers probably would, um, necklaces, things like that, um, probably feature on your things, list of things that exist. Um, so metaphysics looks at what is there in the world and what is its nature? Because once you've um, postulated the existence of something or decided on the, the existence of something, you have a further question to ask, well, what's it like? So, um, for example, um, I told you that Heraclitus postulated atoms um, more than 500 years B.C., well, he didn't know what they were like, except that, by definition, they were the unsplittables, okay? Because an atom was as far as you can go. An atom of water is as far as you can go. Uh, sorry, no, I'll have the water down here, please. Um, I don't want them to drink it. <laughs> That's all right, thanks. Just stick it down on the floor there. Um, where was I? Water. water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, here. There are quite a few atoms of water on my finger. Um, but at some point, you'll get down to something such that if you go below that, it won't be water. It'll be CO2. Uh, it'll be a molecule, but it won't be water itself because you'll have gone too far for it to be water. So... You postulate the existence of atoms for whatever reason. It could be as a theoretical entity. So some people postulate God as a theoretical entity. How do we explain all this? We need something like this. Let's call it God. Okay, so how do we postulate this? We need something unsplittable. Let's call it an atom. And of course, you might, when you actually, because once you've postulated the existence of something and you have some idea of what it's like, you then want to find out more about it and you want to see if you're right to think it exists. So, for example, the Higgs boson, uh, we have reason to think it exists. We have various ideas of what it's like, which I won't go into because I don't know enough about them. Um, we believe in its existence enough to spend millions on this large hadron collider um, in Switzerland. Uh, but when we actually find it, if we actually find it, then we're going to know more about it. And that's what we're doing. We, we've postulated it. We said this is on our list of things that exist at least as a hypothesis, now we want to test that hypothesis and see whether it's true. So metaphysics asks questions like, what is there and what is its nature? Now, obviously, many of these questions are questions of science. Um, so the Higgs boson, does it exist? What's it like? These are questions for science. But questions like causation... What is causation? Does causation exist? <laughs> causation, the relation between cause and effect. That's not a question for science. The scientist must assume that causation exists. Philosophers ask, does it? And what's the nature of causation? Could causation go backwards, for example? Could there be a cause that happens after its effect? Um, is causation a relation between events or between objects or between facts? Or what are the relata of the causal relation? So these are all questions of metaphysics. Um, <coughs> epistemology, on the other hand, is the study of knowledge. So there's a big difference between what is the case and what we know or can know to be the case. There may be things that are the case that we'll never know. 
and I've mentioned three consecutive sevens in the decimal expansion of pi before. So what you know and what is the case, you hope that what you, if you know, well, actually, if you know something, it must be the case. Um, but what you hope is that what you believe you know is actually the case. But the study of what is the case and what you know to be the case are two different questions. One's to do with metaphysics, the other's to do with epistemology. So epistemology looks at what can we know. Can we, for example, know that the sun will rise tomorrow? Do you remember when we were doing logic, we looked at induction. Um, can we know it? Well, we don't know for certain. Must knowledge be certain knowledge? Or could it be the case that we know something that we don't know we know? Do you see what I mean? What is knowledge like? Um, so, actually, I should have put that here. What is knowledge? What can we know? And how can we know it? So, for example, if there are moral values, um, we don't know it by uh, sensory perception. I never see right and wrong, uh, certainly not through my eyes or through... Uh, tactile sense or, or anything like that. So there must be some other way. How do we know that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Again, you don't see that that's the case. How do you know that all swans are white? I know they're not, but let's pretend for a minute. Um, how do you know that all ravens are black? That's a better one. Um, well, let's forget albino ones. I know what you're like. <laughs> I could see you thinking that. <laughs> How do we know that, given that if, you, if you're going to say that all ravens are white, you're talking about all ravens, even the ones that you've never seen, even the ones that nobody has ever seen, even the ones on Mars, if there are ravens on Mars, you're saying all ravens are black, includes those ravens on Mars. Well, how can you know that? Do you see what I mean? So there are two different questions. There's what is knowledge in the first place? Must we know that we know something or can we know something that we don't know that we know um, what's it got to do with justification what's it got to do with belief etc uh, and how can we know these things so that's the distinction between metaphysics metaphysics is to do with truth and what is the case and what's its nature epistemology is to do with knowledge justification belief and how we can know whatever it is that we do know. So that's, that's the main distinction. Let me just pour myself some H2O. H2O. Oh, what did I say earlier? <laughs> I, I suddenly remembered that I... I, I heard myself saying something false. Well... Right, okay, let's look at ontology, the study of what there is or what exists. Okay, one question, I, I said earlier that there are many things that, uh, questions of what is the case and what is its nature that are questions for science. But questions like, does God exist? Um, in The God Delusion, if any of you have read it, uh, Richard Dawkins claims that this is a scientific hypothesis like any other. <laughs> Um, well, if that's true, it must be possible to conduct experiments, observations, um, in order to determine the existence of God. I have no idea what experiments or observations he has in mind, but I actually don't think this is a question for science. I think Dawkins is wrong to think this, this is a straightforward scientific hypothesis. Um, I think this is a question for philosophy. Uh, our, Evidence, our reasons for thinking God exists, take the form of uh, arguments rather than evidence or observations. So, for example, the most obvious argument is, is the one I used earlier. God is a theoretical entity. Uh, he's postulated to explain the existence of the universe. Okay, that's the simplest argument. It's the argument that people have used uh, from the beginning of time. Um, other people use different arguments, for example, the moral argument. You don't need God to explain the existence of the physical world, but how come there exist people like us who are capable of rationality, who reason, who have free will, who make choices, uh, and in particular make moral choices? People like us who value things, who see right and wrong, good and bad, beautiful and ugly, and things like that. Um, physics can't see right and wrong, good or bad, etc. 
uh, this is not the sort of thing that physics or, or any physical science can investigate. Um, but you might think that God is the explanation for the existence of things like that. Or you might deny that. You might say, no, you don't need God to explain right and wrong. You can easily explain right and wrong by appeal to evolutionary biology. So altruism is, is a, a question of um, either kin support uh, or if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine, etc. So if you look at Dawkins' chapter I think it's four, but I may be wrong about that. Uh, he offers four or five arguments for how you can explain morality without God. Um, so does God exist? Lots of different arguments for the existence of God. Lots of different rejections of those arguments. Lots of different comebacks on those rejections. And philosophers are going to have a job for at least a couple of hundred years, I think. I think the God delusion is far from the final word on it. Um, but there are other questions like that. that that's a biggie, obviously. Um, but there are other biggies. Do moral values exist? Is there right and wrong? Do, does right, is there really a property of an action's being right or wrong? Or can we reduce the idea of being right to something, um, some people would say, uh, natural, like um, happiness? So the utilitarians want to reduce happiness to the, uh, sorry, reduce right and wrong to the idea of the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So there's no more to right or wrong than, than how many people you make happy by an action that you do. Now what you're doing there is you're reducing one thing to another thing. So here's something we don't understand, right and wrong, and we think that it needs an explanation and we're tempted to postulate God for it maybe. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, if, if we can say, well, actually, we don't have an explanation for that, but there's actually no more to that than this in particular combinations, um, and we do have an explanation for this, or at least this is something for which we can think that there'd be a much easier explanation than God. So on the grounds of Occam's razor, um, given two explanations, both of which work, you always go for the simpler one. If you can explain happiness and you can reduce morality to happiness, then you haven't got a problem with morality. You don't need to postulate God. See what I mean? So um, you might, I, I mean, some people try and reduce the idea of God to, um, I mean, actually Dawkins again does this. Uh, he thinks that God is the idea we all want for security, for a, a father figure, a, something to, to rely on. Um, so he's reducing God to that. Um, the utilitarians try and reduce moral values to uh, happiness. Kant, on the other hand, isn't a reductionist. He thinks right and wrong exist, that the moral law exists in and of itself, and that it's quite different from anything else. So if you remember last week, for Kant, a moral action is an action that's carried out because of reverence for the moral law, it can't be said to be anything else. It can't be said to be something that just as a matter of fact produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number. And reverence for the moral law, says Kant, is not something you can reduce to anything else, something easier to understand. Another example of this would be mental states. I, don't, I thought I was going to come to mental states, but I see it's not on there, so I'll put it in anyway. Um, do mental states exist? Well... What are mental states? Well, mental states divide into two. There are the so-called prop propositional attitudes. So attitudes to propositions, things like beliefs. You can't have a belief unless it's a belief about something, can you? So I believe that um, yeah. Anne is wearing sort of maroon. Is that maroon? Right, there you are. Uh, I believe Anne's wearing maroon. Uh, I believe when um, Anna's got a necklace on, uh, somebody's got a lovely pink jumper on just in front of Anna. Fuchsia sort of colour. Um, okay, all of those beliefs have a content, uh, but there are other propositions, pr propositional attitudes, so I can have a desire towards the same content. Desire is a different attitude, but I could have the desire that Anna's wearing a necklace, or I could wish that... Um, God, Anne is wearing, is, 
all the same names, isn't it? Is wearing maroon. Um, I could also intend that Anna's wearing maroon. I, I could set out to make sure she wears maroon today because I want to use her as a, an example. So these are lots of different attitudes to contents, and you can get the same attitude and different contents and the same uh, content and different attitudes. So that's one type of mental state, the so-called propositional attitudes. The other type is the so-called qualitative states. So um, when I looked at this lady's lovely fuchsia-coloured cardigan, um, I have a certain experience. Okay? There's something that it's like for me to see that cardigan. There's something that it's like for me to see these chairs. There's something it's like for me to be in pain or to feel a tickle, or something like that. And these are qualitative states. They're states that have a quality to them. Um, so I'm sure you can do your own rough and ready distinction now into states that have a certain raw feel to them and states that are attitudes to propositions. Why do we think these exist? Well, how could I possibly explain your behaviour without citing desires, beliefs, intentions, hopes, fears. You know, why did she suddenly get up and leave the room? Um, answer, because she suddenly realised it was the wrong lecture. She suddenly realised it was the wrong lecture. So she had a belief about what the right lecture was. She suddenly came to believe that this was the wrong lecture. So she formed an intention to leave the room. So... In order to explain your behaviour, I postulate all sorts of beliefs and desires. But here's another little story. Um, wood lice. Um, why do wood lice congregate under rocks and things? Tell me. It's dark. Why, why do co wood lice congregate where it's dark? Because they want to be safe or, or something like that. Okay. And they, and they believe it's safe under rocks. Okay, you're a bit reluctant to attribute beliefs, are you? <laughs> well, don't give my story away. They just keep moving until they get... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, when we first see a woodlouse, and certainly if we're speaking to a child or something like that, we, we would use belief-desire psychology to explain woodlouse behaviour because it, that's what comes very easily to us. So woodlice believe that it's safe under rocks and they want to be safe, so they intend to go under rocks. As a matter of fact, the correct explanation of woodlouse behaviour is that they embody a mechanism such that when it's dry around them, uh, they move. And they move in a, a speed that's determined by how dry it is around them. Um, and as it gets damper, they, they come to a halt. And incidentally, they move in whatever direction they happen to be pointed. They don't sort of turn around and make for that rock. If they're standing in that direction, there's a rock over there, they'll go for that one. Except they're not going for that one, are they? They're being pushed by the dryness. Now, once you know that explanation... Have I got it right? Yeah, please. That's right. I wasn't going to use technical terminology, but there you are. Okay, so that's the proper explanation of woodlouse behaviour. Once you know about kinesis like this, you can explain the behaviour of any woodlouse anywhere at all, as long as it's a normal woodlouse, anywhere at all at any time. Once you know that, belief desires have been made redundant, haven't they? You know, why should you postulate woodlice beliefs now or woodlice desires. In fact, all their behaviour is explicable in terms of things like, like kinesis. They're not all kinesis, but they're things like that. What about your behaviour? Can I explain your behaviour? Well, a lot of your behaviour I can explain. If I chuck my chalk at you, that shows how old I am, doesn't it? If I chuck my chalk at you, you're going to duck. Um, that's not a, a, a desire or belief-driven behaviour. That's just a hardwired response to the fact you see something coming towards you. If you put your hands on a hot plate, do the same thing. So lots of your behaviour, and that's just one, if you hear a, an ambulance coming, you'll move out of the way. That's a classically conditioned response. Lots of your behaviour doesn't need to be explained by appeal to beliefs and desires. But much of it does. And this is why we postulate beliefs and desires. This is why we say that beliefs and desires exist. But perhaps ethologists, people who study animal behaviour, are going to find out one day that we can explain all our behaviour in terms of brain states. 
And it might be that we can, um, one time in the future, we'll be able to saw off the uh, skull of newborn babies and fit a perspex dome instead so that we don't have to go in for all this interpretation, which we're actually not very good at, is it? Um, trying to find out what we're all going to do. Instead, we can just look at somebody's brain and say, ah, okay, I know what you're going to do. Perhaps we'll all wear wool woolly hats so we can surprise people or something like that. But do you see, if we could explain all our behavior without appealing to beliefs and desires, we'd no more have reason to think you had a mind than we do to think would lice do. So, again, the question, do mental states exist, is a huge question. Lots of people try and reduce mental states to physical states uh, and then explain physical states. That's, it's much easier to explain physical states than mental states. But if you don't want to be a reductionist, if you want to say you cannot reduce mental states to physical states, and there are all sorts of reasons to think you can't, um, then you're going to have to postulate mental states. You're going to have to postulate contents and qualia. And the minute you do, you're going to have problems with, with functionalism, with um, physics being able ever to understand mental states. And my goodness, you might end up having to postulate God or something again. Or maybe not. We don't know. So, again, the question is, what is this? Does it exist at all? If it does exist, can we reduce it to something else? If we can't reduce it to something else, what is its nature? Here's another one. What about possibilities? Okay, I might have been wearing jeans, mightn't I? Okay, that's a possibility. But, and what's more, it's a possibility that's actual, isn't it? It's an actual possibility. Well, what is a possibility? What's the nature of a possibility? It's not something that actually exists, is it? Okay, so maybe we've got to postulate a different sort of existence now. There are things that actually exist, and there are things that possibly exist, and there are things that don't even possibly exist. So there are square circles don't even possibly exist. Unicorns, might they exist or not? Marianne's wearing jeans certainly is an existing possibility. Do you see what I mean? You're, you're now getting layers of existence, different levels of existence. Well, I mean, that little kitten on the floor down there, is it fat? You all looked. <laughs> <laughs> um, you understood what my words were. Don't you need to postulate um, a little kitten down there in order to give meaning to my words? Some people have thought that. If you do, then that little kitten exists, but it doesn't exist like Anne does. So you need, again, another layer of existence. Blah. But is that existence? Well, some people have said, no, it's not, quite, not really existence. Let's call it persistence instead. Um, but, but the thing is, you've got to say, if you say that every... Um, in order for you to understand the meaning of that little kitten is fat there needs to be a concept of a kitten or, or a kitten or something. You know, there's a kitten that gives meaning to the words, but it's not an existing kitten like the kitten that some of you may have at home. So it's a persisting kitten or, or a, an imaginary kitten is another way of thinking about it. But do imaginary kittens exist? Well, do they? In imagination, there you are. There's another way of thinking of it. So it's existence, different types of existence. There's existence in the real world and there's existence in your imagination. There's existence in novels. I mean, when, you, when it comes up, this little kitten down here, it could be black ginger or anything, couldn't it? I haven't told you anything about what it's like. But we all know that Sherlock Holmes wore a deer stalker, didn't we? Did he? Something like that, wasn't it? Okay, so there you've got, again, different levels of existence. We all know that unicorns have horns. You know, well, there aren't any unicorns. Well, how come unicorns have horns if there aren't any? Do you see? Anyway, so do possibilities exist is, is a really difficult one. That's the sort of thing that leads people to postulate the existence of possible worlds. And I think I've mentioned possible worlds to you before. Lots of people postulate possible worlds, but they're not realists about possible worlds. Mathematicians, logicians, physicists, 
many of them, all, all those disciplines postulate possible worlds. Not all people in those disciplines do. But if you postulate possible worlds, you can see possible worlds as reducing to possible situations in this world, or you can see possible worlds as real. Um, and David Lewis, very famous philosopher, postulated the reality of possible worlds, and he said, well, I've never really heard a very good argument against them. A look of blank astonishment doesn't count as, a, as an argument. <laughs> what about physical objects? Well, you might say, well, obviously they exist. You know, how can I deny that that exists? Okay, well, let's do a Cartesian thought experiment. In fact, let's do the Cartesian thought experiment when I have some water. Descartes was um, interested in the fact that we know that some of our beliefs are false. But in the very nature of things, we don't know which those beliefs are. You see what I mean? I mean would you like to tell me for sure that all your beliefs are true? I suppose that would depend on what you mean by true. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, what about you? Well, I don't know, and then suddenly I thought, what is a belief? A belief is ah. No, it isn't. No, no, a lot of your beliefs are false. I, I guarantee. If you believe it, you believe that it's true. That doesn't make it true. Okay. Does it? No. no. I, I believe it's true. You believe it's true, exactly. But this, this is the problem with beliefs. Every belief you have, you believe it's true, because that's what a belief is. To, to have the attitude of belief towards a particular content is, is to assent to, as philosophers would say, that content. So in believing that this chair is blue, there's the content, that chair is blue, and I assent to it. I say that is true. That's what a belief is. But of course, I may be wrong. I may be colorblind or something like that. you believe the chair to be blue? Surely you say you know the chair to be blue. Well, uh, given the circumstances in this case, I probably would say I know, but the fact is, let's not bother about that. I was just offering that as a... But, but you have beliefs about a lot of things. The question is, you know that many of those beliefs are false, but you don't know which they are. And in the very nature of things, anything that you believe, you believe to be true, because that's what truth is. You cannot have a belief that you don't believe to be true. But you do know that not all your beliefs are true. Well, Descartes became very interested in this, and he said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take myself away from the world. In the world, we have to assume that our beliefs are true because we have to act on them. Um, so in believing that chair's blue, if I'm looking for something to match it, I'll go and look for something blue. Okay, we have to act on our beliefs. He's going to put himself away and think, okay, how do I know that my beliefs are true. What is it that justifies me in believing that my beliefs are true? Um, and he thought, the method I'm going to use to do this um, is to treat as if false any belief I can entertain the slightest doubt about. So if the belief that I believe to be true could be false, I'm going to put it on one side as if it really is false, and by that means, hope to find something that, I can, that is absolutely certain, and from that, maybe I can build up the rest of my knowledge. So it's a bit like you know some of the apples in your basket are rotten, but you don't know which they are. So you take each one out, and any that's a little bruised, you put on one side as being maybe that's rotten, and you hope to be left with only the good apples in the basket. So Descartes wanted to look at his beliefs and say, if there's any about which I can entertain the slightest doubt, I'm going to treat it as if false. Okay, so he's not saying that his beliefs are false. He's saying it's as if they're false for this. So first, he went down three levels of doubt. Um, the first one was the argument from illusion. Okay, the argument from illusion tells us that... Um, well, our senses have deceived us. I expect all of you have been deceived by your senses. Sometimes you've got home that wonderful skirt that you thought would go so well with that blouse and you've got the colour wrong. Uh, the lights in the shop were the wrong colour or something like that. We, we've all been deceived by our senses at some time. Well, if we've all been deceived by our senses at some time, should we take all the beliefs that we base on our senses and put them in the doubting basket? 
treat them as if they're false? Should we? If our senses have deceived us, should we treat all our sensory beliefs as false? Okay, put your hands up if you think yes. Okay, put your hand up if you think no. Okay, now tell me why you think no. Why must there be that possibility? Uh, because you can't know otherwise. Well, hang on, we've got two lots of can'ts, knows here. There's, what we're suggesting is that your senses have sometimes deceived you. Does that mean you can never be sure that your senses are, are not deceiving you now? No, I can't be sure. No, you can't be sure. So, Sometimes we do trust our senses, don't we? I mean, as a matter of fact, how do you know that your senses have deceived you? <coughs> well, hang on, you experiment, you prove it. How? How do you do this? How? Through your senses. Through your senses. Give, can you give me an example? Yes. Possibly not. I go to pick up a frying pan and expecting lots of heavy weight, and I pick up a light pan. Woo, yes. Like that. Yes. yes, good one, okay. Um, so your belief that it was heavy, although that's actually not a sensory belief probably, is it? Well, yes, because I, you put so much anticipated... No, no, but it's not a... When you, your belief that the frying pan was heavy, yes. you can't really look at a frying pan and tell it's going to be heavier. Maybe you can, maybe you can. Let me give you Descartes' own example, because I think it's a, it's a good one. De Descartes said, if you put a stick in water and it looks bent... Okay, you've got reason for thinking that the stick is bent. You take it out of water, woo, it's straight. You've got reason for thinking the stick's straight. Well, okay, there are two possibilities. Maybe when you put the stick in water, it bends it. Or maybe it just appears bent. So how do you test this? You put your hands in the water, you feel the stick when it's underwater, and lo, it's straight. Okay, so you've now got two reasons for thinking the stick straight and only one but the thing is you couldn't even know that your senses were deceiving you unless you rely on your senses so all we got to here from the argument from illusion is that we know that not all our sensory beliefs are true not all our sensory beliefs are true sometimes usually in um unusual psycho-optimal conditions, or maybe not unusual, but um, not perfect psycho-physical um, conditions, our sensory beliefs deceive us. But you can't go from the um, universal possibility of illusion to the possibility of universal illusion. Would you like me to say that again? No? Oh, I liked saying that. Say Would you like me to say it again? Thank you. Thank you. You cannot go from the... Uh, universal possibility of illusion to the possibility of universal illusion. Are you with me? Okay. So all those who said no, you're right. Uh, we do know that our senses sometimes deceive us, but that doesn't tell us that we, we can put all our sensory beliefs into the doubting basket because we would never know that our senses deceive us unless we rely on our senses. So that's the first argument. Second argument Descartes went to was the argument um, uh, from the demon. The demon argument rather than the argument from the demon. Um, the de uh, sorry, <laughs> dream. And anyone who knows what they're talking about will know that I'm talking rubbish. Second one was the dream, the argument from dreaming. Okay, so you're sitting here, you're in the fire, you're, uh, the lights are on, everything's fine, you're looking at your hands in front of you. How can you doubt that? Your senses aren't deceiving you now, are they? But on the other hand, says Descartes, haven't you ever been in the situation where everything has seemed to you to be a certain way, and then you've suddenly woken up and found it wasn't that way at all? So it looks as if all the sensory evidence is in, and yet you're still wrong, your belief is false. So you believe that the hand is in front of you, it's exactly with you as, as it would be if your hand was in front of you, but your hand's not in front of you. As a matter of fact, you're dreaming. Okay, does that mean we should put all our sensory beliefs in the doubting basket? Put your hand up if you think yes. Put your hand up if you think no. 
<laughs> You're beginning to get this now, aren't you? Why not? Uh, man in white, um, or beigey sort of jumper. Sorry, I've picked on you and you don't have to... <laughs> okay, would anyone else like to answer? Why, why can we not put all our sensory beliefs in the doubting basket now? Because we wake up. And what does that tell us? That, that we're not always asleep, exactly. That sometimes our beliefs are true. Sometimes when I've got my hand in front of me like that and I'm thinking my hand's in front of me, uh, I am awake. And the reason I know that is because if I didn't wake up, I couldn't know I was dreaming. So it's exactly the same structure of arguments as, as in the first one. But whereas we got rid of all uh, sensory beliefs that are formed in, in suboptimal psychophysical conditions here, here we've got rid of a lot more, haven't we? Why? Do you want to... Well, it's the contrast, isn't it? Um, Right, but, but, the, but in order to know that they are like that, they must have woken up. Well, okay, but, but with you, I'm quite sure you've had lucid dreams okay. where you've had the dream and suddenly you've woken up and you thought, wow, yes. you know, who could have believed that I was dreaming? Yes. Uh, so sometimes you can know you're dreaming. Sometimes you can know you're dreaming, but it's the lucid dream that's, that's good for this one. But what have we lost here? What's in the doubting basket now? No, incidentally, there's another thing I want you to notice, that lots of people think, I mean, it's hell, <laughs> sheer hell being a philosopher at a party. Um, because that when people find out you're a philosopher, they're going for little games like, Oh, good, tell me that this exists. Does this exist? Why not? And you say something and they say, oh, no, it doesn't. You know, tell me how, tell me how. And they're playing a, a sort of skeptics game that's extremely irritating. I hope none of you ever play it. Um, Descartes found reasons for doubting everything. He didn't just doubt. He took beliefs he believed to be true and he looked for a reason to doubt them. And it's only when he found a reason to doubt them that he put them on one side. Um, so he wasn't just doubting. Um, he wasn't playing the, skept the skeptics game. He was actually looking for reasons to doubt. So what have, we, what have we lost here? What's in the doubting basket once you've got the argument from dreaming? Well, no, because when you are, you know that sometimes your belief there's a hand in front of you is correct is true. So you don't, you don't lose that you do sometimes see your hand in front of you, but what do you lose? No. No, you, no we're looking for certainty. We're, we're wanting to know what isn't certain as a result of this. Some things are left certain. Uh, I mean, it's left certain, for example, well, okay, I'm asking you that. What is left certain? Um, that when you are awake, your, dream, your beliefs, your sensory beliefs, if they're formed in, in um, optimal psychophysical conditions, are true. You've still got no reason to doubt that. It's just that um, you can say that unless I know I'm awake, I cannot know for sure that there is a hand in front of me. Okay, do I know that I'm really awake? Answer, no, I don't, because I could be having a lucid dream. But I do know that hands exist and that I can see them and that chairs exist and that I can see them. Or if you don't like that, because I can, in, in our dreams, we sometimes put together things in strange ways. Um, I can know that blue exists and that... Um, so you can go to simple things, horses, horns, whiteness, things like that. The simple things from which we build up complex things. I know that they exist. So we're losing something of the world here, but we haven't lost the whole world yet. Um, there's still an awful lot that we know. I don't know anything to be true now, 
but I do have reason to believe that it is true. If I, it is true sometimes, i.e. when I'm awake and I have these reasons to believe things. But then we get down to the demon argument. And at the demon argument, Descartes says, okay, well, I'm assuming, aren't I, that um, these experiences that I have as of my hand and of blueness and so on, I'm assuming that these experiences are actually caused by something outside myself um, and that the experience that I have is a, is a guide to the nature of the cause of these experiences. So my experience of blueness as of a blue chair is causing me to think that that experience is being caused by a chair that's blue. And you've got a problem here because... In order to know that A causes B, you've got to be here, haven't you? You've got to see a correlation between A and B. In the same way, to know that A resembles B, you've got to be able to see both A and B. But are we ever in this position with, result, with respect to our experiences and the causes of our experience? No. Never. We're always here, aren't we? Didn't leave enough room for my arrow. Um, we experience the world, if you like, through our experiences. We can never get outside our experiences to see what the world is like, to see what's causing these experiences. Um, so it could be that our experiences are caused by something completely other than we take them to be caused by. So here's the demon. Sorry, I know it looks like a cat, but it's a demon. Okay, the demon opens up a gap between our experiences themselves and the causes of those experiences, and it actually says, how do we even know these experiences are caused? Why aren't they just experiences? One following the other, following the other, following the other. And there's nothing out there at all. And actually, Descartes at that point says, I can't do this. Um, I'm going to put the demon there because I, can't, I find it impossible to believe there's nothing other than my experiences. Um, but I can think that there's some cause of my experiences which is completely other than I take it to be. And some people have tried putting evil scientists in here, um, but that doesn't work because an evil scientist isn't magic. Um, what you're trying to do, the demon is just there because it's impossible to imagine that your experiences don't have causes at all. So you're putting something there so that there is a cause, but the cause is completely other than you take it to be. Is that my... Did he panic because it's like people saying, well, after death there must be something, otherwise there's no point? It was frightening. Um, he didn't panic for that reason. But no, he, he just literally couldn't wrap his mind around the idea that there's nothing outside causing your experiences. You try it. It's really very difficult to to get yourself to the point where you understand that there might be no physical world at all. Your experiences could be exactly as there are, as they are, even though nothing else, else exists. So all there is is Anne's experiences as of Marianne giving a lecture in philosophy. There's no Marianne, there's no philosophy, there's no lecture, there's no blue chair. But it does seem to me very similar It's, it's, it is a frightening experience. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing, yeah. nothing beyond death. There's nothing beyond the But it's nothing to do with God. It, it's, oh, no, no, yeah. I just said that's sometimes why people want to have a God. But yes. I, I didn't actually say about God. I just said people worry that there is nothing after death. Okay, but, but this is a, a different thing because it, it's, it's not worrying about ex, uh, that sort of thing. It's, but it is a worrying thought. I mean, we want our beliefs about the external world to be true, don't we? And yet what's happening is that we're discovering that what Descartes said was that uh, actually once you've done this thought experiment, you realize that um, there's the world and there's your picture of the world, okay, all your beliefs that you've formed about the world and you go through the world updating your beliefs all the time. Um, but once you've 
um, retreated into your picture of your picture of the world, which should be here, but I ran out of room, um, the world actually becomes unnecessary. Because if all there was was this, you couldn't ever get outside to see whether this is there or not. So once you've pushed yourself back into a reflective position, um, you see that uh, the world that you picture is quite different from your picture of the world and that your picture of the world could be exactly as it is even though the world was completely different. And that's the Cartesian thought experiment. That's hyperbolical doubt. At this point, you've, you've started the question of how can we know? I mean, we do take ourselves to know that there's an external world, a physical world out there. But what's our, what possible justification could we have for this, given that um, all we can do is go and look for more experiences? And our experiences are exactly what we, we are asking. Are they caused by something? And if so, what? I can't step outside my experience. Of course, no scientific experiment is going to tell you the answer between are my experiences caused by an external world or are they caused by an evil demon? There's no, I can't go down and say, oh, is it a chair? Oh, yes, here we are. It's a chair. Why can't I do that? All I'm doing is giving myself more experiences, aren't I? I'm now having a tactile experience as well as a, a visual experience, and there's an auditory one there as well. But, I mean, they're only more experiences, aren't they? But if we have the same ones... Who are you? <laughs> Hang on. I'm having another experience at this moment. It's an auditory one. There's, um, you know, it, it's as of that's someone... That's what? why people say, did you see what I saw? They do, but no, no, hang on. You haven't got yourself into hyperbolical doubt, has she? Why hasn't she got into hyperbolical doubt? She's not looking at her experience of her... Of, of, she's not looking at her picture of her picture of the world. She yes, it's... A, she's a, no, no, uh, she still thinks that I should think that she exists. <laughs> um, I have, lo I have very good reason to think I'm having experiences as of a female wearing maroon sitting in front of me who's speaking to me. But these are just more of my experiences, aren't I? I can no more get outside my experiences to check whether Anne's really there and whether she's really telling me what I think she's telling me than I can to see whether the chair is there. All I've got is more experiences. So all I've got is more of this... Um, here, and I still haven't got this, which is what I need. So there's no point in looking for corroboration, which is why there can't be any scientific um, way of testing which hypothesis is true. So here I have my experience of the external world. Of those, I can be certain. Okay, I abs I'm absolutely sure now that I'm having experiences as of a lecture theatre, etc. What I want to know is, are those experiences causing me to form beliefs that are true, i.e. there is a lecture theatre? Now notice the difference between I believe there's a lecture theatre and there is a lecture theatre. Okay, the latter is metaphysics, isn't it? The former is epistemology. I can be certain of the former, I can be certain of my own beliefs, but I can't be certain that these beliefs are true, can I? And it's at this level of hyperbolical doubt, at the third level of doubt, that you start to wonder, do physical objects exist at all? Interestingly, Descartes thought that you could show that they did. Descartes wasn't a sceptic. Um, lots of people think he was, but in fact he wasn't. He did this sceptical um, thought experiment in order to preempt scepticism. Um, he ended up believing in the existence of a physical world, but he thought it was necessary to believe in God first. Isn't he, didn't he say, I think therefore I am? He did. That That's right. Cogito ergo sum. And the reason he did that, can anyone think why he did that, thinking of what I've told you so far? What's that? It was all he had left to believe in. That's right. Once you've got yourself back into your picture of your picture of the world, 
um, and your inability to determine the existence of the world that you picture, the only thing of which you can be certain is that you're thinking, isn't it? So here's my belief, um, and let's, the content of my belief is um, the chair is blue. Uh, I've got the attitude of belief towards that. I've now got another attitude, which is that of doubt towards that belief. Do you see what I mean? You can't doubt your own beliefs without seeing that you have these beliefs. And that's what Descartes says. He said, the very act of doubting makes me see that I believe. And if I believe, I exist. I don't know what I am like, but I exist because I exist as a thinking thing, as a thing that thinks. So I think, therefore I am, is because that, once you've been in hyperbolical doubt, that is the only certainty you have. You actually have a few more about what you think, but, but you don't need to. I think, therefore I exist, encapsulates it rather neatly, I think. But you see, you cannot doubt your own beliefs without seeing that you do believe something or other. All you don't know is whether that belief is true. Could I come back to the mm. argument from illusions? Because the illusions are the illusions of the mind. Sometimes those are what? Sometimes those are true or, or uh, can be believed. But if you, I mean, looking at evidence, for example, from physics about the nature of the universe, about sort of wave particle forms, about what the nature of matter is, all that kind of stuff, what we're seeing is an extremely distorted view of reality. Looking at the evidence from psychology, our perception is a highly flawed, all our senses are highly flawed, our brains are constantly filling in stuff that's around the edges and doing all kinds of fiddling about with what actually might or might not be out there. So actually we know pretty much what we are experiencing, much of it is an illusion. Um. I'm afraid that in what you're saying, you're making it clear that you haven't got into hyperbolical doubt either. Well, I do understand um, hyperbolical doubt. Well, in that case... On the hand, I mean, I, I wasn't arguing from the point of hyperbolical doubt. I do understand what the nature of that is. Personally, I think there is stuff out there, but I don't think it is what we experience. Well, we can, but we can agree with all that and, and accept... I mean, all Descartes is asking is, can we be certain that our experiences are being caused by anything. Secondly, can we be certain that our experiences are a good guide to what there is? Now, what you're saying is that the second, we, we know empirically that the answer to the second question is no. But of course, for him, the most important question is the first one, also, not the second one. There's evidence coming out about the sort of nature of consciousness and the self, which the implication is that, that what we may perceive as being ourself is actually, again, quite illusory. Yes, yeah, sure, but uh, I mean, this is more grist to Descartes. Well, I mean, it, it's either irrelevant, excuse me, or, or it's grist to Descartes' mill. I mean, um, you can say, you can add these in, if you like, to the argument from illusion, but the argument from illusion is only the first step of Descartes' argument, and, and the step that really matters is this one yeah. and, and that's the one that takes us to hyperbolical doubt and that's very definitely a philosophical or metaphysical question not a, an empirical one yeah. there's no way science can show us no, there is no such thing as empiricism if all there is is my experience uh, well there still is but the empiricism is nothing more than me testing out one experience against another which is a bit like testing out one newspaper against another um, it's not going to get you very far. Why, why does he prioritise thinking so much? I could better understand it if he said, I doubt, therefore I exist. Well, I doubting think, is a form of thinking. I think is, is, is almost <coughs> less proof of existence than 
than than a blue chair is. Well, well you could at least bring in other people. No, you can't bring in other people. No, you can't. You can't bring in other people at all. The doubting is not... What you're certain of by doubting is that you believe. Because in order to doubt, the thing that you doubt is a belief of your own. Or you can doubt that you think. Well, exactly. A, a belief is a thought. It's a type of thought. So you're, you're doubting that you're thinking. And in try, you try and doubt whether you're thinking... And you will become completely certain that you're thinking. And so <laughs> Descartes um, says, isn't it strange? Because I would have thought that the world was far more um, present to me than my own thoughts. In fact, my own thoughts have always seemed to be rather shadowy, you know, things that I'm not really certain of at all. They're, you know, I can't hold them or see them or touch them or so on. Uh, but having done this, I now see that my thoughts are far more certain to me than the external world, which could be nothing. Um, so he, uh, he, you know, he thinks he's gone from something, or he's found something really surprising. Once you move from the perspective of um, picturing your world, so I'm, I'm thinking of the world that I picture, not my picture of the world. Usually the only time I'm thinking of my picture of the world is when something's gone wrong. You know, I thought I, hang my, I hung my coat here. Okay, I believed I hung my coat here. I now have reason to believe it isn't there. What's gone wrong? So I've been pushed back into my picture of my picture of the world in order to question whether my belief is true or false. But of course, usually I come back almost immediately. Oh, there it is. And, and so I immediately move back into my picture of the world, looking at the world. But what Descartes did is he, he forced himself to stay here, where what he was reflecting on was his picture of the world, rather than the world that he pictured. So he's looking at his beliefs and thinking, are they true, are they false, are they justified, are they not? Instead of looking at the chair and thinking, is it blue, is it hard, is it... Okay. Do you see why people are out here, not in here? Anne isn't a belief. My belief about Anne is a belief, but Anne is here. And Marianne's belief about Anne is what I am certain of. But I'm certain of it until I doubt it. And the minute I doubt it, I can be certain of that belief, but I can't be certain that it's true. So whatever Anne says is, is just more of my experiences. So if Anne says it's blue, you are experiencing... Anne say... It's blue. That's right. Or I believe that Anne says it's blue, and I know that um, my belief that Anne says it's true does not make it true that Anne says it's true. <laughs> And as I can... You too will be able to do this when you become philosophers. Do you see what I mean? You, once you understand what you're saying, it, it becomes easy to say it, although now I can't say it again. <laughs> but I'll have to get the flow of it back. Okay, do you see why people are outside? Just a thought. I was thinking, when my, when my daughter was little, she used to think we had two houses. And she thought we had one that was down the end of the road that came from preschool and one that came oh, yeah. down the road from school. My cat thinks we have two houses. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, is it... But she would have had no doubt about that belief. And it, was it when she began to doubt the belief and then obviously then realised that we're not quite that rich, we've only got the one house. <laughs> um, is that almost the doubt of the belief makes it real? I don't know. I well, there's a very interesting... Between three and five, children actually acquire the, context, the content, concept of a belief... And until that point, there's evidence to think that they don't properly form beliefs of their own. But this, um, there's a, an experiment that goes, um, Maxie the puppet, um, whoever it is who's looking after Maxie, I can't remember, um, puts a chocolate in a box and then Maxie goes out to play and the children are watching this. And Maxie's mum comes in, takes the chocolate from the box and puts it into a cupboard or something like that. Then Maxie comes in from playing, and the children are asked, where is Maxie going to look for the chocolate? Now, all the three-year-olds say, in the cupboard, because that's where they believe the chocolate is. They know the chocolate is in the cupboard. 
Okay, so they, that's where they think Maxie will look. The five-year-olds will all say she'll look in the drawer because they've understood that the difference between appearance and reality. Okay, the world can appear to you to be other than the way the world is. And what your daughter did, she, she linked up her two beliefs and saw, oh, that house is that house. But what she had really wasn't a belief in that sense then. How old was she? Three, yeah, yeah she, she probably wasn't really yeah. having beliefs at that point. Yeah. You, the thought is you don't really have a belief until you have the concept of belief because once you, it's only when you've got the concept of belief that you have the difference between appearance and reality um, and you see that beliefs can be either true or false so you can grasp the contents, concept of conditions of truth and falsehood and at that point you can really actually believe something whereas up until then it's just that you're just responding to a world because the world is, you don't make any distinction between the world's being one way and it's appearing one way. You don't see that those can come apart. Do you define it as a belief then? No. In that no. Except, I mean, we'd call it one when we're speaking loosely, but uh, no. Okay, um, right, let's move on a bit because, um, I mean, we've, we've been doing a lot of epistemology here under the heading of metaphysics, but, uh, of course, actually, there's the metaphysics of epistemology, just to confuse you, um, because, of course, if you want to know the truth about knowledge, then you're doing the metaphysics of knowledge and, therefore, the metaphysics of epistemology. So we were looking at ontology before we got on to uh, scepticism, um, but... So we asked ourselves whether these things exist, but we can then go on and ask, well, what are they like? You know, if we believe that God exists, is he all these things? Um, how can he be all these things? Because surely there's contradiction here, isn't there? If he's omnip omnipotent, he can do anything at all. If he's omniscient, he knows everything at all. And if he's benevolent or good, then how can he see the suffering in the world and not do something about it? Um, so can God be all those things? What about moral values? If they exist, are they absolute or relative? Do we all have our own moral values or is there a moral law that's objective and that exists for all of us? Um, are there different possible worlds or only different possible states of this world? And what's the difference between those two? And what about physical objects? Are they independent of us or bundles of our ideas? Barclay, uh, Bishop Barclay, thought that um, scepticism was so threatening, the idea that we couldn't be sure we had knowledge of the external world, that what he thought is we had to build the external world from what we could be sure about. So the only thing we can be sure about is our own experiences. So what is the external world other than bundles of our own experiences? Now, this may sound daft, you know. I mean, there's more to Anne than my experience. If I touch her, she'll say, ow, or excuse me, or something like that. Um, but actually, there again, what have I got other than my own experiences, auditory experiences, uh, etc.? Um, so what Barclay was saying was actually if you think of all your experiences and all your counterfactual experiences, in other words, if I came into this room at midnight, that blue chair would still be there. Do you see that's a counterfactual experience? I would still see that blue chair. Um, there is no more to an object than our experiences or counterfactual experiences and actually you try and convince me that you have any reason to believe that the physical world exists that doesn't appeal to either an experience of yours or a counterfactual experience of yours and you'll fail I'm sorry, I don't understand how you're using counter. I thought that counterfactual was, I thought counterfactual was against fact it is if I came into this room last night at midnight that's that's not true i didn't come into this room at midnight i was fast asleep in bed um but had i come into this room at midnight last night i would have seen that blue chair and that's part of my reason for thinking that that blue chair exists independently of me is that it was here all the time it would still be here if i came back tomorrow 
But it might, well, exactly. And so what Barclay is saying is, is that there is no reason I can give for believing that that chair exists that doesn't depend on either an actual experience of mine. Here, it exists, you know, and you're having experiences of this chair now as well, if you exist. Um, or counterfactual ones. If I came in tonight, it would still be here, i.e. I would still see it. That's true, um, but I would still, uh, okay, but that, that's, if I had come in last night, it would have been there. Yeah, but I should be able to answer that, and I can't because I'm tired. Um, um, what about bruises? If somebody had moved it, I wouldn't see, have seen it. Okay, I might not be able to follow it, but it's certainly true that I have reason to believe that this chair would have been here simply because it's tied to the floor. Um, I mean, that's not conclusive, and that's not a very good response no to what you're it saying. I've no reason to think it won't be, and my, what's more important, to the, you, you try this as a thought experiment for yourself. Try and give yourself reason to believe that something that you believe exists, exists. Okay, so you believe this exists, what are your reasons for believing it exists, and see if you can find one that doesn't depend upon your own experiences, either your actual experiences, I can see it, feel it, touch it, hear it, or your counterfactual experiences, if I was there then, if I did this then, if, do you see what I mean, then I would, so you won't be able to do it. Barclay uh, was much cleverer than people think. People tend to think that he thought of the external world as a ghostly sort of thing, but he's just offering another explanation for our experiences. <laughs> And the fact that we go from these experiences to thinking there's an external world. We do that immediately. Why do we do this? Okay, so, so this is, that's metaphysics. Then moving to epistemology. What is knowledge? Okay, do we have knowledge? We've looked at that in some depth already. Do we have knowledge? Descartes would say we can't claim to have knowledge of the external world unless we can get over his thought experiment, which he thinks we can. Um, what is knowledge, though? Some people believe that it's... Okay, well, let, no, let me ask you this. What, what is knowledge? We've been talking about knowledge for the last hour and a half or something. What, what is it? <laughs> that was very optimistic of him, wasn't it, launching out like that? <laughs> Good for you. Go on. See if you... I'm just saying that it is what we have experienced and gathered from our experience of the external world. What do you mean by gathered? In our sensual... Um, in, in our senses. But we have knowledge of things that don't involve senses, don't we? Two plus two equals four is not sensory knowledge. So what is knowledge? Well, we, collect it and put it in our brain. we collect it and put it in our brains. How do you put something in your brain? Well, I don't know that. I don't know the uh, physics of it. Well, actually, you don't... Um, it's I'm not sure you intentionally acquire knowledge anyway. Most of the time, the knowledge you acquire isn't acquired intentionally. It just... Um, sorry, what did somebody else say? I said acquired. It's certainly acquired, but what is it we acquire? Memory. Memory is involved, but there's a difference between memory and knowledge, isn't there? I mean, uh, in order to remember something, that something has to have happened. Um, so you only have knowledge if you remember it, so I think memory is a very important Mem Memory is important, but memory is different from knowledge. It's not the same thing. Memory is essentially time related, whereas knowledge isn't essentially time-related. It can be time-related, but it's not essentially so in the way that memory is. You could look, look in a book for knowledge, it doesn't mean to say you have to remember it. Yeah. Like well, and, and I mean, there are different sorts of knowledge, aren't there, as well? I mean, I know how to ride a bike. Well, I remember. Do I remember it? Well, it's not propositional knowledge. Um, okay, let me tell you what one answer, the classical answer to the question of what knowledge is, is that it's justified true belief. Okay? If you're going to have knowledge, you must have a belief. That belief must be justified, and that belief must be true. So, um, you believe, or you, 
You know that I'm wearing an aubergine dress, don't you? You all know that. They have very good colour concepts here. You have a belief that I'm wearing an aubergine dress. Do you? Mm-hmm. Yep, OK. Is that belief justified? Yes. How? You, you can see it. Yeah, OK. You're justified in believing that. And, and let me tell you that it's true. OK, so you know I'm wearing an aubergine dress. So that's the idea. That, so if a student comes to me and says, well, I, Descartes said such and such, and I say... Why do you think that? And he says, the, uh, I don't know. And I say, okay, well, what, what follows from that belief? And he says, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, why do you think that? And he says, I uh, don't know. He doesn't know it, does it? Does he? He may have a belief about that. Um, but it's, and it, what's more, it may be a true belief, but it's not justified, therefore it doesn't count as knowledge. He doesn't know it at all. Um, if you don't have a belief about something, you certainly can't know it. But the other one, and the one that most people get more worried about, is that you cannot know something false. If, it, you cannot know that I'm wearing a yellow dress, for example. You can believe that you know something false, but your belief that you know it is itself false. Are you with me? So if you actually know something, that thing must be true. So Maxie comes in from playing, and she does she know that the chocolate is in the drawer? No, she believes she knows the chocolate is in the drawer, but what she doesn't know is that her mum took it out and put it somewhere else. So she has what she thinks is knowledge, but it's not knowledge because it's not true. She's got the belief, she's justified in the belief, but the belief isn't true, therefore it cannot be counted as knowledge. So you've got to, again, make that distinction between what you believe to be the case and what actually is the case, because you can believe you know something that's false, but you cannot actually know something false. This is the, the crux of William Morris's dictum. Only have in your house those things which you believe to be beautiful and which you know to be useful. Yes, I'm not sure it's the crux of that, but it certainly comes into it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, OK, so, um, but here's a little problem for you. Gettier came up with this little problem. It's called, and it's been called ever since, Gettier problems. Um, you have seen me driving a, um, a golf GTI around Oxford. Um, you've come to believe that I own a Golf GTI. As a matter of fact, there is a Golf GTI that I own, but it's in my garage, and the one that you've seen me driving around belongs to a friend. Okay? Do you know that I own a Golf GTI? No, no. You believe? I believe. No, sorry, you believe that you know, but do you know? No, you don't know. Why not? Well, it is justified. No, you've seen me driving around in it. You're perfectly justified. It's not true. It is true. I've got one in the garage. You don't know that you don't know. No, you don't know that you don't know, but you don't know. But only you know that. That's not the point. <laughs> Oh. You haven't told us that you own it. Um, there's no reason necessarily to assume that you own that car. But we do usually claim about um, claim to have knowledge without having certainty, don't we? I mean, you've seen me driving this car often, um, so you know you you think you're justified in claiming to know that I. Now I'll tell you what's happened here: is the conditions that make your belief true i.e. the car that's sitting in my garage that you've never seen me in, come apart from the conditions that justify your belief, the Golf GTI you've seen me driving around in. And it's only if the conditions that make true your belief are the same as the conditions that justify your belief that you can have knowledge, uh, that what you have counts as knowledge. So what Gettier showed is that it cannot be the case that knowledge is justified true belief. Justified true belief may be necessary for knowledge, but it's not sufficient. You need some other claim that makes it impossible for the truth conditions